So it's my privilege here tonight to introduce the keynote speaker. Bill Stoll is the CEO and general manager of the Des Moines Waterworks. But unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know that Bill has been this, at the center of a water quality controversy. I'll let him tell you about that. But um, Bill basically has had the audacity to say that no one, including farmers, should be able to pollute our waters with impunity and pass those costs of pollution downstream for others to pay for. Now you might think that would be common sense, but in Iowa and much of the U.S. that is considered a radical idea. <laughs> the effort that Bill has been spearheading is really changing the dialogue about water quality, not only in Iowa, but nationally. Last night, maybe some of you saw on public television yep. a, a program uh, when Bill was featured in, so that's wow. great. Now, politicians have been long clinging to this idea that for agriculture, water quality improvement should be voluntary. For other industries, it's mandatory. But for agriculture, we believe that somehow, somewhere, someday, we're going to improve our water quality voluntarily. Well, I've worked on water quality issues for about 30 years on and off when I was at USD in Washington, D.C., for example. And I've got to tell you one thing, it ain't going to happen. And also, as a soil scientist, I want to tell you that, what Bill, that Bill has science on his side when he points out that most of the nitrate coming down Iowa's rivers comes from agriculture, in spite of the denials of many politicians and agribusiness leaders and farmers. The bottom line is that Iowa's corn and soybean cropping system is fundamentally flawed. It's inherently leaky of nitrate, but that's a discussion for another time. Bill is well qualified to take on this water quality channel challenge he has a bachelor's degree from Cornell College, a master's degree in engineering from University of Wisconsin, a master's degree in industrial science, uh, industrial relations from the University of Illinois, and a Juris Doctorate from Loyola University Law School. Now, and just the just last thing I want to say is that Bill's work on water quality reminds me of a quote from Do Thomas Jefferson. In matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. And we're fortunate, Bill. Yeah, if you're doing that for us, thank you. Thank you, Francis. Don't we all wish he were the Secretary of Agriculture? USDA, Francis. How terrific to be here. Uh, Jefferson County is beautiful. Jefferson County, thank you for your welcome. It is terrific to be here with you. Uh, I know there are some folks here that are from probably Missouri, some folks from Illinois. As Iowans, the bulk of us know these issues. Uh, these aren't new to us. But as a state, we're waking up to it, and you have a huge part in JFAN in that, and Diane and your board in JFAN, give them another round of applause for their leadership. <laughs> I'm gonna be really careful not to go over my 30 minute limit, so away we go. Iowa, first in the nation. Many of you, like me, probably have family that watch CNN or Fox News or MSN and think of us as the first in the nation in terms of selection process in this goofy year. I'm not sure that's a bragging right. Whoa, now I get what you said, Joyce. This is a little bit of a trick, but uh, operator here will see me through it eventually. We're not only first in the nation in that kind of superficial caucus process, which probably gets overwhelmed by all the other states in a while, but we all know we're first in the nation in a number of industrial agricultural outputs. Corn, soybeans, sometimes Illinois beats us out, but I think it's been a while there. Hogs and eggs. You know, all those things, once upon a time in our lives, probably seemed good. We're beginning to question that now. There are consequences from our leadership here. Consequences our state elective leadership doesn't want to face. Here's a consequence. 
Hopefully you can see this blue-green algae blob uh, just to the north of Des Moines in one of our water sources. It's a horrible circumstance. One you hear about in the Great Lakes, one you're going to hear more about here in Iowa. We have too many fertilizers in our surface waters in this state. By fertilizers, nutrients, nitrogen, and phosphorus, I'll be talking about it. Our friends at Iowa State, our agronomists, a uh, very, very gifted group of folks at Iowa State. Don't make any bones, it's corn and soybean related. It's not natural to our soil. We go back a hundred years and look at what nitrate numbers were. They'd be a fraction of what they are now. It's because of anhydrous ammonia, chemical fertilizer, and it's because of manure. And a small portion of that may be human related, as in animal waste associated with us as humans, but we know better as Iowans. We're in a state with three million people and 21 million hogs. What do we carefully manage through sewage treatment facilities and closed process? The waste of three million people. The 21 million hogs, well, we feed the world. <laughs> One of, my, you know, one of my favorite recent Des Moines Register editorials was about the myth of feeding the world and how terrific it is for media to have the courage to be able to take on these kinds of issues in a state like ours. But the idea that we're feeding the world, you and I know that in corn we're feeding people's gas tanks through ethanol, in hogs, we're sending them to China, and we're stuck with the waste associated with it and the ruination to our environment as Iowans. <laughs> Animals are big business in our state. We talked about the number of hogs we've had. The amount of waste that's generated by hogs is multiples of what it is for human beings. I've seen some studies that indicate that if we were to convert it, it would be the equivalent of having a state with over 60 million people in it. So huge impact on our environment. This is a monocrop state. We're a corn state. We have a little soybeans in there once in a while, but we may have corn and soybean rotations. We forgot about biodiversity. We all understand that biodiversity brings extraordinary benefits. Nature is not made to look like our state, full of corn and soybeans and row, crop, row crops and hogs. When we look at other uh, exports from Iowa, ethanol, again a huge one, renewable fuels, I always find that such an odd name for corn-based soybean products or corn-based ethanol products. What a wild stretch of the imagination. It's a little bit like feeding the world. <laughs> ah, I'm, I'm going to catch the drift here before we're done. I may have your head spinning in terms of where we were. I hesitate to talk about crisis. When I can't find my car keys or I can't find my glasses, it's not a crisis, it's an inconvenience. When we talk about water issues, we better be talking about it in terms of the potential, at least, for crisis. A lot of folks who've been up here tonight have talked about uh, water and its critical public health aspect. It is not a preference. It is not um, who wins the World Series or who you want to be president or who you want to be uh, United States Senator. It is a critical issue to our survival. And it's an issue that we seem to whistle past in this state, despite growing facts that indicate that we are coming to a crisis. In 2016, we've had more beach advisories, more advice from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources not to have contact with a public beach, largely because of bacterial issues. And we know where that bacteria is coming from, right? 
We had a record number of impaired waters identified and some discussion about that with Diane and talking about the moratorium itself. Every two years there's a process where the state under federal requirements looks at whether reaches of streams and lakes and rivers are acceptable for public health standard. The number of those that are not acceptable in this state is at a record high. It's gone up 15% in the last two years since it was surveyed. When that's resurveyed in 2017, I'll be surprised and pleasantly surprised if it doesn't go up again. In my business and trying to make drinking water out of river water, and that's what we do in my area of Iowa, we take our water directly from the Des Moines and Raccoon rivers, we have to denitrify. We have to remove this fertilizer, this nutrient called nitrate concentrations. Last year we had to do it essentially every other day, 50% of the time. The record before that was 100 days, 109 days, uh, a decade ago. So we are seeing something change very radically in a way that's unacceptable to us from a public health standpoint. You all know about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right? We're part of the Mississippi River Valley. We send nutrients, particularly in the form of phosphorus and nitrogen, into the Gulf and it chokes off marine life there. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, and I will show you a few pictures, I'll go back to that blue-green blob you saw earlier. A year ago, talking to you, or 10 years ago, talking to you, I'd spent a lot of time focusing almost exclusively on nitrogen as a concern. What we're finding, like Toledo, Ohio, uh, was a few years ago, now we're seeing blue-green algae and the toxin that it creates as a huge concern for us because we've never seen it in Iowa at the levels we're seeing it now. And our understanding of the science of toxicology tells us, like in Toledo, it is a huge public health consequence. Nitrate is fairly defined as to both the levels but who the risk groups are. We're all in part of the risk group associated with cyanotoxin or blue-green algae. You unfortunately will hear more about that as time goes on. You know, Iowa once was a beautiful prairie state. I know our friends across the river in Illinois talk about them being the prairie state. In 1850, we looked like this, largely grasslands, some nice wooded areas around the waterways. Now this is the way we look. We're a row crop state, 23 million acres or so under row crop. Our state has fundamentally changed from its natural hydrology and natural biome to what we have now as part of industrial agriculture. And you and I, each of us, are a casualty to some degree of that change. I have the pleasure of traveling regularly, not just to Southeast Iowa, and I love coming down here, but to uh, environmental groups, in particular and water groups across the United States, many of them, you know, confuse Iowa with Ohio, or I was, I was asked how the potato crop was by a New Yorker last week. I try to tell them, yeah, that's another I, you're close, sort of. Um, I am from Iowa, I owe wildlife an apology. Our state has been devastated. We have devastated our state in an engineering attempt to be more productive in industrial agriculture. Uh, does that look like a moonscape to you? That looks Martian to me, or moon-like. That's Hardin County, Iowa, which is just, just to the north of the Des Moines area. There's nothing natural about that hydrology. And many of you, like me, probably feel a little nostalgic and think, how beautiful it is to look out at a green corn crop from time to time in a nice summer breeze. Uh, unfortunately, six months of the year, that land lies fallow like this, uh, draining all kinds of pollutants, unfortunately, into our waterways and also creating air quality concerns for us. That is drainage on an industrial scale. There's nothing natural about that seen a lot of maps today and they all kind of show you this same dispersion of issues. 
I want to introduce a term here that may be a little bit too sciencey for some of you, but it's something called the Des Moines lobe. It's a hydrogeological term for that area that is our watershed in the Des Moines and Raccoon rivers in central Iowa. We in the counties in central and north central Iowa, you see there in kind of a beige-ish color, were part of a pretty recent uh, hydrogeological glaciation only about 15,000 years or so ago, come down, in, come down through Canada, through Minnesota, bringing some incredibly rich soils to our area of the state, a little bit different than here. Uh, even driving down here today, I come from a lot flatter, a lot less green area of the state, a lot more cultivated area of the state. The soils and the topography are really very different. Uh, those soils, that area, recently glaciated, would naturally be a swamp, and was a swamp until about 150 years ago when we tiled the hell out of it. When we made that land that corn could be planted so its feet would be reasonably dry. Unfortunately, the partnership between corn and livestock is a very clear path, right? Uh, many of you, like me, who've grown up, who know how the business works, know often the CAFOs, the animal feeding operations, are very close to a feed source in corn. You're very fortunate because of JFAN and their efforts in your area of the state having relatively few uh, animal feeding operations. Mine, because of a lot of reasons, probably a lot of them land use issues and developer issues, we have very few, but our watershed generally is full of them. Hamilton County and Hardin County, where you saw um, that industrial grade drainage, is full of them, as is further northwest Iowa around Plymouth County. Huge problem. Look at the Barron's quote there that's in the inset that talks about the proliferation of animal feeding operations. Growing up in this area, I remember when most livestock was in a pasture. And then 20 or 30 years ago, everything was in confinement. That has changed the playing fields in so many ways, in so many ways that are bad for us as Iowans. Huge proliferation of how animals are treated in the prisons that they're put into. You remember a couple years ago, we had a huge avian flu issue here in Iowa. Very little was written about that that focused on how vulnerable we are in animal feeding operations and confining, whether it's hogs or cattle or birds, in those kind of circumstances. My understanding is the state spent roughly $100 million in making the producers whole and trying to remediate that circumstance. That notion that we should, as a state, support those kind of operations, to me, is offensive. It should be offensive to all of us. Great quote from David Osterberg, who many of you know. David is a great guy, uh, now in Iowa City with the Iowa uh, Policy Project, um, saying, wow, we sure love to be friendly to those who operate, but as Joyce talked about, for those of us who live around them, huh, that's just feeding the world. That's a phenomenon that we have to live with. I want to talk about economic development in Iowa, and you're close enough to a couple of these touch points that I'm sure you have to scratch your head about, too. You know, when I think of economic development, I'm probably of the age that thinks uh, nostalgically about manufacturing jobs, and union jobs, good working conditions, great communities associated with it. But in Iowa, our Iowa Department of Economic Development and our state leadership are really more interested in making nitrogen cheaper. We want to build more anhydrous plants, one not very far from us here in Lee County, heavily subsidized by the state, another one in the Sioux City area. And by the way, let's help the, pre the prestigious and other folks come in because that creates such great community and great jobs, right? If our idea of economic development 
is cheaper nitrogen, then we might as well understand that our vision as a state is this beautiful state between two rivers is nothing more than a large feedlot. <coughs> You know, and I, I work for a government. I work for an independent waterworks that's a regional entity, and I work for folks who are elected. Uh, the five people who are my bosses, who hire and fire me, they've hired me at least, hopefully they won't fire me, are appointed by the mayor of Des Moines. So I understand a little bit about the process and the importance of public rulemaking and transparency. Certainly, um, the media plays a great role, despite what you hear in the presidential campaigns about holding us accountable as public uh, officials, and they should continue to do that. But when it comes to groups like the EPC, the Environmental Protection Commission in this state, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, in my experience as governor, a huge inclination for those folks to be talking with industrial ag and forgetting about those of us that are part of the environmental movement. That's a huge problem that we need to get our hands around. Keep your eyes on that. <laughs> Diane talked about the Alliance for Responsible Agriculture. Um, and actually, in your uh, beige folder, there's an indication of all the groups that are part of that. JFAN and ICCI are huge leaders, as well as PowerSheet cares in that group of folks who are talking about a moratorium. We need a moratorium in this state for no other reason than we have no idea how to manage the public health consequences of the genie out of the bottle that we've already created with 21 million hogs in this state. A moratorium is needed now. And don't think that uh, this is an easy process. You know that it's not. We know that it's not. Um, this genius, Zippy Duval, um, and I used to live in the South, lived in the South for a number of years. Uh, Duval is a great Southern name. Uh, Zippy, uh, I'm pretty confident, is not his Christian name. Um, but this is the kind of mentality. This man is the president, the president of the American Farm Bureau. The Clean Air and Clean Water Act is an invasion of our private property rights. And I'm sick and tired of it, I know you all are too. Wow, I can see him getting all red-faced and bulbous on that one. <laughs> this mentality that property rights, Trump community rights, Trump public health issues, is something we as voters, we as citizens, we as Iowans and Missourians or Illinoisans absolutely have to keep in mind. The other side on this issue is not only well-funded, but they believe they have a philosophy that says, this is the Wild West. Whatever we can get away with, we should get away with. And it's enshrined in these kind of comments by their president. I've got a few more minutes to talk a little bit of science and I'm gonna do it. Um, drainage districts, who are the defendants in the lawsuit that Des Moines Water Works is responsible for as plaintiff, are something that you don't see a lot of in this area of Iowa, but I think you get the idea. This beautiful soil in my area, the Des Moines Lobe, where we have this glaciation that creates unique soil and water uh, characteristics, that soil has to be drained. What you see in the left is corn emerging. I don't know, uh, anymore, or it used to be knee high by 4th of July, uh, it's probably May, it's emerging. Um, beneath that soil, about the depth, uh, I'll say a meter, that's a little bit deeper than that, about a meter beneath the soil has to be drained. There has to be flexible tubing like that to make that soil productive. Corn, again, does not like wet feet. And what it's doing is it's artificially short-circuiting the natural tendency of soils or filtration, the biology of soils, to use pollutants effectively, and it's mainlining them into the waters of the state, particularly the waters of central Iowa, 
uh, that I unfortunately have to draw from to be able to deal with an increasingly thirsty and populous area of central Iowa. These are where the drainage districts are in Iowa. You see Fairfield and the Red Star way down here in the southeast. I'm not even sure here in Jefferson County whether you have a drainage district. They're almost all in our watersheds. And so this false private and public plumbing process called moving water quickly full of pollutants over into the waters of the state is pretty unique to us, but creates significant concerns for us. There are only two or three areas in the United States that have that. One of them is Toledo, Ohio that drains ultimately into Lake Erie. That's where they've had the harmful algal bloom issue that we talked about a little bit. The other one's around Champaign, Illinois. They drop deep wells to get away from that surface water problem and take it from the aquifer. We can sure talk about aquifer water. Uh, the reality is that's fossil water, that's glacial water. It's not rechargeable. When you take from the aquifer, several thousand feet, you're taking from Mother Nature and you ain't going to give that back. So those of us in major cities in the United States, and Des Moines by no means is a major city, but any of the large cities in the United States use surface water because that truly is something that's redeemable. Whenever it precipitates, whenever it rains in northern Iowa, in a few days that's going to come down to us as water. When it rains, and uh, water has to travel through 3,000 feet to the Jordan Aquifer, very little is gonna make it through that process. So when we drop a well and take it out of the aquifer, we're cheating nature in a way that's irreversible. Nitrate, big issue for us. Probably as we look forward, it will be now maybe trumped, ooh, wrong term, may be exchanged for cyanobacterial uh, issues. Nitrate in water, NO3, is a problem for the very young, particularly six months and younger. We're a regional hospital corridor in the Des Moines area, I'm sure you recognize. We have Mercy or Unity Point, uh, charter hospitals. We have a number of folks who come to our area. Neonatal, very busy in our area. So a huge concern for us emerging uh, science, particularly coming out of Pete Wire and uh, the University of Iowa, that's now looking at all of us uh, being in health categories that are threatened by nitrate concentrations. Very regulated, 10 parts per million is the lawful amount that can be in the drinking water that you drink here in Fairfield, we drink in Des Moines, or your cousins drink in San Antonio, Texas. But we have a huge problem with that because it is the form of fertilizer that comes to us in surface waters. More of Pete Wire's research. Thought I'd show you a trend line. The Raccoon River, we draw water from either the Des Moines or Raccoon River. We actually prefer the Raccoon because we have two of our large facilities, our water treatment plants, on the Raccoon River itself. There's a trend line since the 30s to now in terms of nitrate concentration on the Raccoon River. And there's some, a lot of variability in there, and I'm not a huge believer in averages. You know, on average, if I put my head in the oven and my feet in the refrigerator, I should be comfortable. I'm not. <laughs> but this does a pretty good job, I think, of saying to our friends in the Farm Bureau that it's all about weather. Oh my God, We're, we can't do anything about nutrients in the water because it's too wet, it's too dry whatever it may be, and there's something going on here in our use of anhydrous ammonia and our use of manure on soils that's triggering this. This is not about weather as a trend line. Some of the years in which it's really, really low, like right here in 2012, flooding does create, it, create an opportunity to dilute it. Uh, we have less concentration, but we sure have bigger loadings. That is more volume, ultimately, that makes it to the Gulf. So folks who are telling you it's a weather card, eh, forget that one. The science doesn't work. We take out nitrate. We have the world's largest nitrate removal facility. Wow! How many people here are as big of a chain smoker as I am? How's that for bragging rights? We got a really big one and it takes out a lot of nitrogen on a regular basis 
but it's a lot cheaper uh, for all of us as Iowans if it's removed at the source, at the field level, not in drinking water processing. Last year alone, we spent a million and a half dollars just to take nitrate out of our water. Our system is running out. $80 million to replace it. Oops. $80 million is what we estimate. That's a lot of money for our customers. And we think the producers should pay to remove pollutants. Again, I want to emphasize to you, it's not just nitrates that we're concerned about. Now we're concerned about other things caused by too many fertilizers in our drinking water or in our source water. Uh, and this is a great aerial of uh, Lake Erie and what happened in Toledo, Toledo, Ohio a few years ago. People in my business thought the Great Lakes were particularly susceptible to this blue-green issue because lakes, water doesn't move much. Algae is more easily formed as opposed to rivers where it goes by. We no longer, unfortunately, have that shield to hide behind. What, we're what we found this year is we had a cyanobacterial problem actually higher in Des Moines for one day than our friends in Toledo saw uh, several years ago. So we we're very concerned about that, and you should be concerned about that as Iowans also. You know, I can spend a lot of time, um, and I will spend just two more minutes talking about some policy issues. Throwing more money at half-baked solutions is not the answer to our water quality problem in this state. What a number of folks have shown us is we already throw huge amounts of public resources into agriculture and incent the wrong behavior. We incent too much production as an example. And what we find is when the public money goes away, whatever thin conservation practices were out there also go away. So if we think that uh, increasing the sales tax three-eighths of a cent is going to change or solve our water quality problem, uh, we have to start with the fundamental issue of who is accountable for that problem, who is responsible for its solution, rather than just give them more public money. This is a huge issue. That we need to You know, Francis touched on this, and as always, Francis does so cogently what I'll take a little bit more time on. The Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy is our state policy here. How are we going to deal with water quality crisis issues? We're going to do it by better educating the producers. We're going to do it by regulating more cities and developers, those of us who live in urban and suburban areas, on what are called point source dischargers where 10% of the nutrients come in our surface waters, but the 90% that comes from agriculture, we're gonna rely on voluntary conservation practices. Anybody else kind of scratch their head and wonder why the system isn't working? 90% of the problem is unregulated, 10% with marginal ability to be able to put new technologies in, far more expensive is being focused on. That ain't gonna work. That dog don't hunt. And then now we're hearing from our friends, well, I, I just heard Bill Northey talk about how 10 parts per million may not be the right public health standard. Maybe that should be something like 15 or whatever. Wow! When elective folks, whether it's the people I work for or it's the people who are supposed to work for you, start playing science, that's a problem. That's a public health standard that peer-reviewed science spent many years to reach, not something that should be changed under the gold dome or in the Wallace building by somebody who has a self-interest in challenging your public health and safety for profit reasons. So be very wary of people who want to change the standard. As a water producer, I don't like the 10 milligrams per liter because it's difficult to reach and it's expensive, but it is a public health protection. People who want to change that, who aren't part of the science community, are risking your health. We're now hearing how much they need, it's taken just generations to get into this water quality problem. It'll take us a lot of time to get out of that. I say to people who say that, don't drink water for all that time and forget about it. <laughs> when you can go without water for whatever time you think the solution is, then you know I'm gonna agree with you. Uh, clearly, this is a public health issue that has to be dealt with 
and our state government has been an abject failure in getting their mind around it. I want to touch briefly on what can happen to reduce water pollutants in this state. There are a number of things in the nutrient reduction strategy, the science part of it, that are pretty good. It says there are things in the field that can be done and things in the edge of the field that can be done. In the field, different crop rotation is an example. Uh, uh, not putting nitrogen on the fields in the fall. We're not growing anything in the fall. Uh, using cover crops. Those are things that can be done within the field. On the edge of the field, saturated buffers, bioreactors, wetlands. Um, but the real thing that I want you to walk out of here is every acre that's under cultivation in this state has to demonstrate one or more of those conservation practices. Right now, only a very thin slice do. We need regulation to protect us from industrial pollution coming up off of industrial farming. And finally, Francis mentioned it. Um, first of all, that ain't natural hydrology. If anybody thinks <laughs> that that's the way God intended our soils and our land to act, wow. That's actually one of the areas that we've tested as part of our lawsuit involving SAC County. Francis mentioned no other business can get away with taking a pipe from their business and taking it to the waters of the state not being regulated. But in this state, agriculture does that. That's the norm. That's the rule. We're challenging that because in my business, that's a point source. That's no different than a sewer pipe or a factory pipe coming out of a tire facility or wherever the manufacturing facility is going into the waters of the state. That should be regulated. That's what the Clean Water Act is. You know, I want to close by going back to a theme you've heard articulated several times. Clean water is an essential element in our biological survival. All of us rely on clean water as a biological unit, as a human being on a day-to-day -day basis to survive. But it's also an incredible connection between us as Iowans, us as Midwesterners, if as a community, we can't do more to protect our clean water and to understand the public health consequences of that than we as a state are moving towards that vision of nothing more than a big feedlot between the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Help us, help yourself to turn that around. Stay involved with JFAN, with ICCI, with Power Sheet Care, whatever it may be. This state needs to hold industrial agriculture accountable for its environmental impacts.